So now I'd like to announce the, the first speaker of the evening, Richard Heap. We'll talk about how to develop native plugins in Flutter, which can be tricky to do correctly. He co-founded Software Hothouse in 2003, where he developed the Avaya Contact Recorder, which has used Dart in its web UI since 2015. He recently co-founded Just Speak, a startup making it easier to use your mobile device as your work phone. He is frequently found answering Flutter questions on Stack Overflow. Uh, let's give a big, loud Flutter NYC welcome to Richard Heap. Thank you. Hey, we're here. Thanks, Martin. Uh, so as Martin said, I'm uh, Richard Heap. Um, and uh, everybody has to have a little known fact about themselves, which is that I'm an, as you can clearly tell from my accent, I'm a native New Yorker. I was born in Huntington, Long Island. I lived uh, here till I was three years old, then moved to Washington, DC, where I lived till I was seven. Uh, did kindergarten and first grade in Washington, DC, and then moved to London, which is where my accent comes from. So, uh, but now I'm back in New York. About five years ago, we had a, uh, a web-based application that was heavily using Java applets. And we needed to move away from using Java applets. Um, so we chose Dart as the way that we were going to end up moving away from that. And, and rather than coding everything into JavaScript. So we do a lot of uh, audio processing in Dart and have been doing for several years. Um, our product is a, a voice recorder, so we need to be able to have a web-based GUI that allows you to replay stuff from that. Uh, so we have tools in Dart for manipulating audio, various different codecs, resamplers, and things like that. And we were using talking down to the Web Audio API. All of that was compiled in Dart to JS. So down at the bottom, you see here a, uh, a typical chain of things. We're going from the a decoder through an effect to a resampler, and then out to the to the um, Web Audio API, audio buffer source node. So. When Martin said, would I do a talk on uh, plugins, I thought, oh, God, what am I going to be able to do? Why can I think of a plugin? So uh, I had a rummage through our Git repos and thought, I know, we can um, do something with audio. I can, I can fish out all of this dark code and see if I can get it to compile and run, on, run in Flutter, which it did remarkably easy. So for one night only, and in... Uh, um, plagiarizing our host's name, we are going to develop Better Stream, uh, which is an audio streaming plugin. I had a rummage around in uh, pub.dev, and there's plenty of ways to play an audio file um, or to stream from the web, but there didn't seem to be a plugin currently available to uh, do what to, to mimic what we were able to do with the Web Audio API, which was to create audio on the fly in the application and just pump it out to the sound card. So I, uh, I found a, uh, an audio effect um, that I'd written four years ago called the Waveform Similarity and Overlap Algorithm, which allows you to alter the, pit, alter the uh, speed of voice but without altering the pitch. So you know if you slow down speech, it's going to get like this. And if you speed it up, it's going to get all squeaky like this. But the uh, Wizola algorithm um, does that in a pitch compensated way. So I'm hoping at the end of the day to be able to demo uh, Car Talk, which is an application for producing the spiel at the end of car commercials where they tell you what the ACR is and all of the terms and conditions in flood. All right, so here goes. Um, unfortunately, we've got to go through a lot of homework first. So uh, what, is a, what is a plugin? Um, I hope lots of you were here two months ago for Jose's talk. Um, he gave an excellent talk on uh, packages. So a Dart package is a, uh, a piece of Dart code 
that stands alone, has a published API, um, and typically comes with a uh, set of unit tests that will automatically test it, and often comes with an example program that allows you to demonstrate its uses and understand how to use it. A plugin is basically a Dart package with a few extra bits thrown in. So it's got uh, three parts. It's got the Dart part, and then it also has either Java or Kotlin for the Android native part, and some uh, Swift or Objective-C for the iOS native part. And the purpose of a plugin is to allow a Flutter pure Dart application to be able to talk down into the native layer to access things that you can't get at from Dart. Like maybe you want to read the battery level or find out what the uh, Wi-Fi connectivity strength is and things like that. Those aren't available in the Dart libraries, but they are available down in native layer. So you have to pull down from Dart into native to do that. And this is, that's what a, a plugin is for. Um, similar to a package where hopefully there's a little piece of example code, a, um, a plugin comes with an example. And the example is a Flutter app, a small vestigial Flutter app that exercises the API of the plugin and shows how to use it. Um, that uh, example app comes along with it, but is discarded at build time when it's actually used by somebody else's application. Um, plugins come with, uh, well, packages come with some requirements as well. They might come with like a minimum Dart SDK level. And uh, they may come with dependencies themselves, and the pub solver is very good at figuring out how to do that. Um, Plugins come with even more requirements because they now might have requirements coming up from, for example, Android. They may require a particular Android SDK level, or they may require, uh, they may call for a particular Android permission in their Android manifest. And the uh, Flutter build process merges together all of the uh, the accumulated requirements of any plugin that a Flutter app is using and makes those the overall requirements and you know, permission requests of the finished Flutter app. Other than that, a uh, plugin pretty much behaves like a, a, a package. Uh, you can publish them to pub, just like Jose was explaining two months ago. Uh, you configure them all through the pubspec.yaml and uh, so they live well within the Dart and Flutter ecosystem. Um, I put this rather scary picture up for us for a little while, uh, because without understanding the Flutter threading model, at least at a basic level, it's difficult to see how a plugin is going to work. Um, so on the left-hand side, you see the platform thread. That's the, that's the native thread. So if you're an Android developer, that's what you would know is the UI thread. Then the, the, the blue threads are the ones that are in the Flutter engine. So they're, they're created by the platform, but they're handed over to the Dart um, VM. And all of the Dart code that we know and love in Flutter typically runs on this Dart UI thread. That's where your stateful widgets are created, you call in its state, where build gets called, where you construct your stateless widgets. They're all taking place on that Dart UI thread. So what happens when you want to um, find out the battery level to, uh, so you can display this in your stateful widget? Well, you've got to get from the Dart UI thread over to the platform thread so that you can run that in uh, the native thread. And that's done by formatting up what's basically an, an RPC-like request. So it gets formatted up, it gets um, marshaled into this 
piece of data that gets left in shared memory between the Dart UI thread and the Meta thread. Meta thread picks it up, unmarshals it, inspects it, figures out what it's asking to do, calls that particular method, gets the result, marshals the, re the result back up again, uh, drops that back into shared memory, and then the, sometime later the Dart UI thread picks that up, unmarshals the result, and uh, if ever you've used a, a REST or a SOAP API, it's, it's very similar. You know, you fire off a request up to the web server, and sometimes later the request comes back. And if you've used package HTTP in in um, Flutter, then of course you know that all of those are asynchronous requests, and they result in a future coming back. And you have to dot then or await that future. Well, guess what? Native requests that work, work like these RPCs going back and forth um, have to end up resolving to a, a future that you have to await to, in order to get your result. Um, one other thing of note before we leave this slide is to say that the, uh, it, it's completely reciprocal, the relationship between the Dart thread and the platform thread. So I've, so far, I've spoken about Dart calling down into the platform, but in fact, it's completely symmetrical. The platform thread can call up into the Dart thread when, for example, it notices a change in Wi-Fi connectivity, it can report that up to Dart by calling a Dart method. So here's our first design of what, what we're going to do to try and replicate my beloved web audio API that I like to hook up to. Uh, so Dart's on the left, native on the right. Um, very first thing I need to know is what the native sound card frequency is, what the sample rate is. So is it, well, on iOS I would know that it's 44.1K because it always is. On Android it's normally 48, but it might not be. So we're going to we're going to create a native call that's going to say to the sound card, what's your native rate? And that's going to allow me to resample the audio before I even send it, I can resample it in dark before I even send it across to the, to the native layer. Then we're going to have a, a start method to say, can you, can you warm up the sound card? A stop method to say we're done. And in between those two, we can say process, which is to pass a lump of audio to be played out to the sound card as, as soon as possible. So we're, we're just about to uh, <coughs> create our first plugin. So um, here are my rules for creating plugins. Um, we're going to be writing in three different languages, and so we have to use at least two IDEs. We have to use Android Studio for Java or Kotlin. We have to use Xcode for Swift and Objective-C. And uh, I, my personal rule, and I, I strongly recommend it, is to use something else for Dart and Flutter. Even if you've been using Android Studio for your Flutter apps up until now, do not try to use this Android Studio to open a, fl a plugin for both Android development and also for Flutter development. Use something else. Use, that, use uh, Visual Studio Code. Use IDEA. Um, and the, one of the main reasons for that is my second rule is make sure you commit frequently because uh, the build process of plugins is notoriously fragile and you regularly end up bricking your project. Uh, I've spent many an hour trying to figure out uh, what was wrong with it, and I, I now have a new rule, which is never mind. Move the old one to one side, create a new one, copy the source code across to it, and you're back up and running again. Um, uh, in preparing for this talk, I've managed to crash two projects and just done, done this. Uh, I opened one, I opened one in uh, Xcode before I'd run it, and um, yeah, that was the end of that. <laughs> try, try, throw it away, make the next one. Uh, I had really hoped to be able to um, show you most of this coded live, but there is a reason why episode six of The Boring Show, if you've seen that,
goes on for 90 minutes. And in episode six, they only create the Android side, and I've got to create the Android side and the iOS side. So I'm going to cheat a little bit with some screenshots and then hopefully show you the live code at the end. Uh, now, if you've ever created a Flutter project by going in, for example, Idea to, or Android Studio to new project, Flutter, whatever, you, you're used to seeing the, the couple of different options for do you want to use Swift, do you want to use Objective-C, what's your uh, package name, and um, all those are doing, that's just a little GUI front end to something called Stagehand behind the scene that's creating this. Me, personally, I like to create them from the command line because then you're making sure that you've got the most recent copy of all of the different little options. So, like, for example, this minus, and, minus, minus Android X, this mouse isn't working, this minus, minus Android X version up, up here uh, is new and it saves you having to create the project and then immediately um, uh, refactor it to Android X. So it, it'll, if you use the command line version, you know you're getting the, uh, the latest switches. So to create the plugin, you do Flutter create, and then you say the template that I want to use is plugin. Uh, you give your, uh, your package name for the Java side, and then you choose for iOS. I chose Swift for Android, Java. I definitely need Android X and uh, the plugin name at the end better stream. And then, as it tells you in the uh, in the plugin documentation, the very first thing that you've got to do is to run the project. So I go to uh, Idea, open the project in Idea, check it out, run it on Android, run it on iOS, and uh, the template has created for you a, a little dummy application that shows you the operating system of the, uh, the phone that you're running on. So behind the scenes, it's done something that you really need to do, which is to like, uh, it's created the pod install for you on iOS, which was my problem the other day. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't run it before I tried opening it. Okay, oh, cool. And uh, Stagehand creates um, several hundred little files for you, and the four that I've highlighted there are, are the ones that are of interest. So under the Android folder, you're going to find a Java file here that is the Android implementation of the plugin. Down at the under the iOS folder, we're going to find the Swift implementation of the project. Under the lib folder, we're going to find the Dart implementation of the plugin. And then under example, there's another Dart file, which is the Flutter app, but the Flutter example app, the Flutter sample app that uh, is the one that you use to demonstrate and test your uh, application, your plugin is working. So to implement your, the, the first thing we're going to do is to implement the Dart end of the plugin. So we'll open the project in VS Code or IDEA and uh, plugin methods are all static methods. So they all look like this. So these are the ones that we're going to create first. Uh, and as I said, they tend to resolve to futures. So we've got a static getter that's async for native rate that is going to do this call of invoke method on the channel. So you can just paste this code directly into the template that's already been created for you. And um, you can see that invoke method is going to return a future and we're just going to await that and then return that. Uh, the start and stop methods follow the same um, 
uh, same format, except that they don't actually return any results. So there's no need to wait for the result to return. They can just return void. Um, start is interesting because it has a parameter to pass down to native. So it's going to pass down an int, which is the sample rate that we want to turn the sound card on at. And you can see that channel.invoke method takes a second optional parameter, which in this case is going to be a map. Uh, and I'm going to map the word rate to that int of sample rate. And we'll see how that appears at the other end in a minute. So that's, that's pretty much all we have to do at the Dart end of the plugin, is to define these uh, static methods and um, give them some names. So now we, uh, we can go to our Flutter app, our Flutter example app, which is in the same project, and we can uh, add something to that. So like, this, is a, this is just the, the standard default stateful widget, and I'm gonna add in this method, init platform state, which is async. I'm gonna call that from init state. It's going to call the static method native rate, the static getter on better stream, it's going to await the result, and then it's going to set state that into this local variable native rate. Um, because it's called set state, that's going to trigger a rebuild. And now, down here, you're going to see that there's a text uh, field that's going to display that native rate. Um, and then, in order to demonstrate, in order to uh, exercise the API, I've added a two raised buttons, one with start and one with stop, and you can see that they call betterstream.start and betterstream.stop on their on-pressed methods, um, passing the native rate in the start. So now we need to catch that method down in the Android layer. So this is where you uh, pull out Android Studio and you open the project. But it's very important to actually open the right folder of the project. So it's, what you have to do is to drill down two levels from the top of the project to the slash example slash Android folder of the project. And that's what you open in Android Studio. Uh, when you're in Android Studio, this is the point at which you can uh, specify the minimum SDK level and any permissions that your particular um, plugin is going to require, your Android implementation is going to require. So uh, in my case, I've used some audio APIs that require Android level 23. So I just specify that in the uh, Gradle build file. And at that point, you also need to go and change that in the example um, folder as well, because the example folder, which is the uh, Flutter example app, now depends on my plugin. My plugin requires 23, so now my example app is going to require 23. So the uh, stagehand has built for us this uh, default on method call. Um, method. And it's got a, a dummy implementation in there. So we cut the dummy implementation out and paste this big switch statement in. So there's two parameters come into on method call. One is the method call, which is essentially like this package of RPC information that's arriving over to, to native. And it also passes in a result, which is how we're going to return any return values or any, or any errors that are going back. Um, the uh, method call has a method on it, and that's the string that we passed in at the top. So we can switch on that into the various different cases. So we've got case native rate, case start, case stop, case process. And uh, 
So the first thing to note is if you fall through to the default, the the way you signal this back to the to the to the Dart end is to call result not implemented, and that throws an exception at the Dart end to say no, nah, the native end didn't understand your RPC call. Um, if you just have a very, very simple implementation like we do for native rate, which is just going to call audio track dot get native output sample rate, then just call that inline and uh, call result dot success to return the result. Uh, and then my normal pattern for anything which is more than one line long is to then break that out into its own separate method and to just call that straight through with the the same call, the same method call, and the same result. So here's how we would deal with process. So process is the one where we've actually, Dart is passing down some audio to us to say, can you play this out of the sound card? Um, so we pass that in at the Dart end as one of these typed datas called uh, float64 list. And uh, that's essentially like a 64-bit float ar array. And that gets turned into, at the Java end, gets automatically turned into an array of doubles. So now instead of calling call.method, we call call.argument, and we pass it the, the uh, key into that hash map of arguments that we passed, that passed it. And uh, this argument call is clever because it's generically typed, and because I'm assigning that to a, uh, a double array, it knows that it's expecting to see a float64 list in there. Um, but you'll get a class cast exception if there's some mismatch. Um, now it can, uh, call that argument can return null if there is no member of the hash map called data. So we have to uh, code for that and say uh, <coughs> if for some crazy reason we got null at that point now we call a, uh, a third method on result which is result.error and explain what went wrong um, so in this case we're just going to say data is missing at that point there's nothing more we can do we just return um, one of my bugbears and one of these days I will actually fix and do a pull request is that um, float64 will cross across the boundary between um, Dart and native, but float32, which is what we use all the time in audio processing, won't. Um, so I have to convert everything, all my floats into doubles to pass them across, and then I have to convert them all back to floats at the other end. So here I'm going to say, or I equals uh, zero to data length, then go and pass these all back to floats so that I can now, in the next line, write that buffer out to the audio track, which is the uh, Android implementation of um, uh, the audio of the sound card. Uh, I'm going to write out that buffer of floats that I've received. Uh, that all went successfully, so I can call result.success to signal back to Dart that that, that all worked, and return from that. <coughs> All right, now we're going to do it all over again. But this time we're going to do it in Swift for iOS. Okay. Uh, so we pull out our third IDE at this point. We open Xcode, and this time we do pretty much the same thing. We go drill, don't open the top level of the project, drill down into example iOS, and open the, uh, the Xcode workspace at that level. And and now our uh, Swift source file is going to be a little bit hidden from us, to be honest. It's going to be under uh, development pods. Um, so here I expanded out where it actually hides um, in the screenshot. So it's, it's under development pods, under the name of your plugin, dot, 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 example, iOS simulates plugins, the name of your plugin, iOS classes, and thanks. There, hiding away at the bottom is highlighted is my piece of Swift. And so now, it looks remarkably similar, sort of, doesn't it? It's a function. It uh, takes a 
flutter method call this time and a flutter result. We switch, as we did before, on call.method into our case statement. Um, for all the same strings, native rate, start, stop, process. Uh, the uh, same rules apply. We have a, a, a trivial answer for native rate, which is even more trivial on iOS because it is going to be 44K. So you just return that straight away. If we fall through to the bottom, we have a slightly different uh, thing here. We call result, and this time we pass result a, uh, a const, this const class flutter method not implemented. But basically, it's exactly the same thing. You did, that's going to be the signal back to Dart that something went wrong. You didn't understand the RPC call. Start, stop, and process are the same as before. We uh, create some um, local methods to deal with those. So here's from process again, by way of analogy. Uh, private func process takes the Flutter method call and the Flutter result as before. And now we have a. I, I, uh, I'm never quite sure whether I think this is better. I, I, I think the, the if let syntax is quite nice here because you don't have to catch the null result, you don't have to catch the class cast exception because we can use this swift swifty if let if let syntax. So we're gonna say if call the arguments is a dictionary, which is what a hash map's gonna look like in Swift, and it has a um, member uh, has a a member of that map called, da uh, called data, and that's a Flutter standard type data. And then I can throw in a couple of other pr preparatory things. So I need to get myself an AV audio PCM buffer, and I need to be able to access the float channel data from that. Then I get finally here to my opening curly bracket, right here. If that's the case, then we know that uh, AU is a, as close as we can get in Swift to an array of doubles. Um, and at that point, what we can then do, and it's, and it's going to be, uh, it's, it's got two extra methods on it, which are, or getters on it, which are element count to tell us how many doubles there are. And actually, it's got a type element count on it as well, uh, a type variable on it, so that we can check that they are doubles and not uh, ints or longs or anything like that. Uh, so we have to do this with safe, with unsafe bytes to be able to get ourselves an unsafe pointer to double. And so that's the way in Swift that we cast that NS data object into an array of doubles so that we can then cast them back into our floats that we wish they were in the first place, um, so that we can then call player.schedulebuffer and pass that through down to the AV audio player node, which is the core audio um, or the AV foundation class that we need to be able to uh, play out to the sound card with. The else statement shows what to do in the case of an error. So remember in Java we called result.error, now here we're gonna call result passing a flutter error to it, and again, the parameters are the same. An optional message, an optional details, and a, and a required code to say what the error is. So, remember I said that we didn't, there wasn't any, uh, there's no flights, but there are doubles. So, I thought I'd give you this little table of the things that you can pass between Dart and Native, and what they look like at each end. So, Dart's down the left, Java's down the middle, and uh, Swift's down the right. Um, and this list is not uh, quite, ex not quite um, complete. There are actually a couple of other ones that you can do, but these are the, the main ones to give you a, a sample of them. So bool turns into a Java lang boolean. 
uh, or into an NS number number with bool in Swift. A double turns into Java lane double. Now it's interesting to note that that's double with a capital D instead of a lowercase d, so it is actually the boxed objectified version of double, which is why it can be null. So when you try and unbox it to a real double, then you could get a null pointer exception at that, and you have to be able to, to cope with that. Um, but because double can be null in Dart, you've got to be able to cope with double being null in, uh, in Java. Um, string becomes string or NS string. Float, 30, so float 64 list, which is an example of a typed data in Flutter and Dart, becomes a double array, which of course is an object and so could be null. Um, so that, that all makes sense too. Uh, and in um, all of the Dart typed data types become this Flutter standard Flutter standard type data that wraps an NS data of just the raw bytes. And it's up to you to interpret those raw bytes correctly. And I showed you how to do that in the previous slide using that unsafe pointer incantation. Now it gets more interesting because you can pass a Dart list across as well. So a Dart list is an array. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a homogeneous array. It can be an array of different things because it arrives in Java as an array list, um, an array list of objects. And it's up to you to pass them to the right types. And it arrives in uh, Swift as an NS array. Um, and again, you just index into it and uh, interpret the parts as you, as you would. Um, you can also pass in a Dart map. It has to be map, angle bracket, string, comma, something. So angle bracket, string, comma, dynamic. So you can pass through a string tagged map of anything you want. And you saw me use that twice in the uh, calling of parameters. So even if we're only passing one parameter, we always make it a named parameter, put it into a map, and pass that, pass that down. Um, if you're just passing in an int, you can just pass that as, as the, the, the one parameter. So just to reiterate, you can pass one and only one argument down from Dart to Flutter, and you can get one and only one result back. But that one single argument and that single result can be something more complicated. So it can be a map, and so that allows you to pass through a whole bunch of named arguments of various different types. And then you pull them out of the map at the other end. Uh, you pull them out of the hash map or the NS dictionary. The other thing to note about this is that they're recursive. So you can pass in a list of maps or a map of lists or a map of maps. You know, and the, the uh, serializer, deserializer will, will cope with that and we will end up at the far end with a whole bunch of, of lists inside lists or whatever you start. All right, so this is, a, this is a reiteration of what I was saying. We always call channel.invoke method passing in a map of string to dynamic of, and then we name our parameters, and then x could be an int and y could be a string in this example. Oh, oh that, the other way around, because it looks like over in the Java side I'm doing string x is called the argument x, and int y is called the argument y. And in um, <coughs> Uh, it's slightly more wordy in Swift. You're going to say if let arguments equals call the arguments as question mark dictionary string any let x is args x as question mark string and y is args y as question mark int. And if anything doesn't work in there, that if statement isn't going to ping, and you're going to fall through to the else, and then you can call result brackets new error. Uh, right. There's only one problem with my design up until that point, which is it doesn't work very well, right? Because passing, having the 
Dart end responsible for pushing packets of audio down to the native side at exactly 10 millisecond intervals or 20 millisecond intervals, whatever we're using, um, ends up working really quite well, but every now and again you're going to get a click because you're going to either underrun or overrun the sound card. And so that's no good. We have to redesign it. So the improved design you'll see now has arrows going from native up to dot. We've done away with process. And now what we've got is get audio coming from native up to dot. So now our uh, typical use case is to ask for the native rate of the sound card called start that says uh, specifies the specifies back the rate that we're going to resample to and would normally be the native rate. That's going to start a thread on the native side that's going to now be responsible for monitoring the uh, the size of the output buffer in the um, uh, AV audio engine or in the whatever the Android one's called now got sufficient space in that buffer for us to be able to write some more it's going to call up into Dart we're going to get a call back in Dart to say I need the next batch of um, next batch of audio please Dart's going to format that next batch of audio pass it back down as the return value of that method call get audio and if anyone's ever used um, the Web Audio API, that's exactly how the Web Audio API works. And so I was able to plug that straight on to our uh, audio processing chain that has never before run in Flutter. It's only ever run in Dart.js. And we get to the demo. All right. Let's see if it works. And you can see here the build method uh, says uh, has nothing more than uh, here we've got the slider and here we've got the text that's displaying the native rate and a floating action button that's going to start the sound card and here's a um, the upsampler stream that's going to be uh, processing the audio up to the 48k of the sound card and it's using the this Dart class called the Wizola stream which is from our uh, web audio API stuff and, and I just wanted to show you that little callback so here's the this is the get audio callback that's coming back from uh, native to Dart. And all it's doing is just acting on a, a stream of audio that it's getting from our audio processing stuff. And it just moves on to the next block of the stream and uh, converts that from floats into doubles in order to get it across the boundary and then returns those doubles. So now we'll find out whether I have a uh, career in car commercials. Customer cash is not available with special APR or lease offers. Zero percent APR for 72 Let's months. Let's try slowing it Available down. for qualified customers only. Higher rates apply for customers with lower rates. Now that's way too, people are going to be able to understand this. We need to speed it right up. APR is not defined with any other customer cash will be offered. And that's it. There you go. Uh, so clearly you have a background in the 
audio processing side. Can you talk just a little bit about your process as detailed as you feel comfortable? Like, how do you, when it, looking at the APIs of all these different things and, and just the discovery of like, oh, how am I going to actually do this on the iOS side? How am I actually, what APIs am I going to use? And do you usually you brute force those catalogs or do you just start Googling around for other similar kind of yeah, the, you uh, you go to and so the question was is um, how on earth do you find out uh, which particular native method to call to do whatever it is that you want, and, and that's actually a really good question because um, in designing your a, in designing your Dart API which is the one that your plugin is going to expose, like my start process stop, or start wait for callback stop. You're having to find a common denominator or a happy medium between the capabilities of iOS, the capabilities of Android, and then trying to provide a as common a layer as you can at the Dart API layer so that, if possible, it's totally seamless to your Dart user, to your Flutter user. Okay, so in this particular case, I was able to do that because um, by using uh, AV Audio Engine and AV Audio Input Node and uh, I still forgotten the name of the Android um, right, the audio writer there. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, if you know anything about the iOS side, there's like three different layers. There's Core Audio, and then there's AV Foundation, and there's uh, something. And um, they actually it's kind of interesting because uh, Core Audio works very much more on a callback method, whereas AV Foundation and AV Audio Engine work on a push method. Uh, so AV, AV Audio Engine is much more like the Java um, uh, default Android implementation. So yes, there's, there's a lot of researching and trial and error and generating just Android apps, and native Android only apps, and native iOS only apps to see if you can find uh, some way to do the same thing in roughly the same way in both of those sides. Yeah. So uh, particularly in audio, like reading the battery level is pretty trivial. Um, opening the camera is pretty trivial. Um, talking to the audio foundation layer is, is more challenging because of the differences between them, between the two operating systems, and trying to make a, a common API to two of them. So in my day job, I talk to a call kit and telecom manager all the time, and, and the differences between them drive me totally crazy. Any questions? I do have a question. Um, I noticed that you were using IntelliJ uh, Speak about the differences between IntelliJ and Android Studio in the sense that you were using two different IDs to develop. I mean, I'm working with Dart on Android Studio. What's the special about? Uh, well, I've been using an IntelliJ for longer than Android has existed. <laughs> so, yeah. Longer than Android Studio has existed. So um, I happen to be an IntelliJ person. Um, Java coder at heart for the last 20 years, you know, so um, I think I get long user discount or something like that. Uh, so I, I tend to just open everything in, in, in IntelliJ or these days in Xcode as well. Um, but to go back to re reiterate my point, um, one of my rules is you shall use two different well, you shall use three different IDEs. Do not try and open the same. Don't try and open your plugin studio and edit the Dart in Android Studio. You will end up tying yourselves in tying yourself in knots. Yeah. I mean, if necessary, just open. But 
open them as two separate projects if you're going to use Android Studio for both. But uh, yeah. Right. <laughs>